the first researcher is Stephanie Shirky. Uh, Stephanie uh, is a uh, wonderful young woman who trained in France, came over to Scripps Clinic, and she then moved to UCSD. She was involved in critical research that helped define the underlying genetics of cystinosis and the mouse that's a huge model of uh, cystinosis for many researchers throughout the world. And today she's going to be talking about an update on her work on a stem cell gene therapy for patients. Thank you, Paul. So let me get the clicker and I will try to see my slides. So I might have to go down the podium. So. Yeah, that's better. All right, so thank you very much for uh, your invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And I will give you an update of where we are with the stem cell gene therapy program for cystinosis. So um, first, I have to start by with my disclosure. So um, I am the co-founder of GenStem Therapeutics. I am also a consultant for AvroBio. So AvroBio is the company who have sub-licensed this uh, project after phase three. Uh, so some representatives are here, but why, why it's important to mention is that if this is successful in the phase one, two, there is already a company who will bring that to the all the cystinosis community. So I think this is really important to, to, to mention. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Cystinosis Research Foundation. All right, so as you have heard, um, cystinosis is due to the gene CTNS. And this gene encodes a, a, a trans transporter in the lysosomal membrane that allows the cystine to uh, exit the lysosome. So when you have mutation or deletion, you have ex you know, accumulation of cystine, you have a crystals. And because the gene is expressed in every single cell, you have what we call a multisystemic disorder. So every single tissue is impacted by cystinosis. So the uh, current treatment is cysteamine, and you see that the cysteamine uh, uh, impacts the cysteine accumulation to, to prevent it. You have also a supportive therapy, so you try to treat every symptom individually. But what we have tried to do in my lab is to, tr to go in the origin of the issue to treat the gene itself. So to, before everything is, that, is, is happening, to avoid the accumulation of cysteine and then the uh, subsequent um, defects. But the issue of uh, doing gene therapy of, uh, with cystinosis, and I didn't know that before I chose this model, is that this gene is expressed in every single tissue and it's also a, a, trans, a membrane protein, so it's non-secreted. So this makes uh, uh, cystinosis a very challenging model for, for gene therapy. So to uh, be able to bring the gene to every single tissue, we have to, to use a vehicle to do that. And the vehicle that we chose to use is something that we all have and are the best vehicle that you know, is in all our body, is with our own bone marrow stem cells. And what, why this is the best vehicle is because the own bone marrow stem cells are already used in ma many, uh, uh, many um, clinical um, uh, disease and uh, they, uh, they are well known and they can access by themselves all the tissues that have uh, some defects. So, you know, at the time, I didn't know if any of these uh, cells could be uh, useful for cystinosis, but to make a long story short, I tried all of them, and the one that worked the best are the hematopoietic stem cells. And these stem cells are making blood cells. So, you know, it was not, actually, it was not the one I thought would work, but, you know, I was very surprised. And we also, uh, I will show you uh, a little bit how this works. So, what we have done first, you know, to, uh, as a proof of concept, we used the mouse model of cystinosis. And we are lucky enough to have a good mouse model that recapitulates pretty well the disease. And so we used, as a donor of cells, a, a, a wild-type mice, so a healthy mouse. Because before you go to any gene therapy program, you want to do a proof of concept and just use mice that express the gene. 
And so these mice are green, and literally green. So like that, we can follow the cells after transplantation. So we did that, and when you do a bone, it's like a bone marrow transplant. So when you do a bone marrow transplant, what you, the first step is you have to make space in your bone marrow. So to do that, in the mice, you have to do a, a, a irrigation, whole body irrigation, and in patients, you have to do a short-term chemotherapy that I will talk about after. So we did that years ago, and we were very surprised that to see that a lot of the bone marrow stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells, were seen in all the tissues, all of them, in, uh, very abundantly. And if you do the same thing in a healthy mice, it doesn't happen. So what this shows is that if you, there is tissue injury, the stem cells will go into all the tissue and try to repair it. And that's a very important point. What we've seen after is that we had um, a dramatic decrease of the whole cysteine content in every single tissue. So in red, you have the mice receiving the wild-type hematopoietic stem cells, and in gray, the uh, control will receive a, not, uh, a stem cell who don't express CTNS gene. And you can see in all the tissue that the, the, the total amount of cysteine was much lower than in the control. So that's a very good point. The, the a very important point then, it was does that impact the tissue degeneration? Can we prevent it? And yes, we could in the mouse model. So the, the uh, bottom panel, you know, here, so you can see a, a, a kidney from a treated mice. And in the middle, you can see a kidney from a non-treated mice. And you don't need to be nephrologist to see that clearly there is a, a difference between the two. And so showing that doing a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation can prevent uh, the uh, kidney degeneration. But then, uh, and this was for the whole life of the mice. So we transplanted the mice where they were like about two months old, and we tested them more than a year after. So it's about all this, uh, the life of the mice. So you do one-time transplantation, and then the disease was prevented for the whole life of the mice. So we checked after their eyes, and as you know, you are in the uh, cornea, you have a, a lot of accumulation of crystals. And uh, this is a non-treated mice, and you can see the cornea of a treated mice one year after one-time transplantation, and you can uh, appreciate that there, there are much less crystals in the cornea, and you can see that even better in this transversal view. The cornea also uh, uh, structure was, uh, was uh, preserved, you know, on the bottom panel. And we also collaborated with Dr. Courtois in Belgium, and he was interested in thyroid, and we showed also in the thyroid that the uh, thyroid function could be uh, rescued. And the structure of the, of the thyroid also could, could, was preserved. So what does this, this suggest? This suggests that you do a one-time bone marrow transplant, and all the tissue can be preserved in the mouse model. So that was very promising. Uh, and, you know, we uh, tried to understand why, because that was the question we always had, how that doesn't make sense, how blood cells can lead to tissue repair. So that's, you know, quickly uh, one slide on it. So what we've shown is that actually the uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells after transplantation, so they will go into your bone marrow, stay there, and be a reservoir of healthy cells for the rest of the life of the mice. If you have tissue injury, the stem cells will migrate to the tissues and they become what we call macrophages. Macrophages are, are cells that eat cells or debris or, you know, pathogen. So it doesn't make much sense to me, you know, I mean, at the time. And, uh, and so finally, we've shown that actually this uh, macrophage, I mean, this stem cell derived macrophage generates a uh, membrane protrusion, like, you know, they, they, uh, they make this protrusion, and what they do is deliver the lysosome, the healthy lysosome containing the healthy protein. So because now the disease cells have a healthy uh, protein, cystinosin, they can release the cystine, and they can be preserved. So this mechanism of action actually is very important because, as Christy said uh, earlier, is that, you know, what we have learned on cystinosis impacts also many disorders. And now we are applying, because of this new mechanism of action, this, the same uh, new treatment 
to Danone disease, another lysomal disease, uh, to Friedrich ataxia, it was mentioned earlier, which is a mitochondrial disease, and others. So we are expanding a lot because of what we learn on cystinosis. So we are impacting a lot of other um, patients. So what do we do now? So how do we go from bench to bench side? Uh, this was very challenging. And thank God I don't know how challenging it was before I started that because I don't know <laughs> if I would have done it. Um, so allogenic, so you have two solutions. Either you take the stem cells from someone else, which we call allogenic transplant, or you can take the, the own patient's stem cells and gene correcting them, autologous transplant. Allogenic transplant is very dangerous because it's not the patient cells and you can have a, what we call Graves versus host disease or immune reaction. So you try to avoid doing that. In contrast, the autologous transplant is safer approach. It's more challenging because you have to gene correct the cells, but it's a safer approach for the patient. So what we do is that first we have to take the hematopoietic stem cells from the patient, from their blood. Then we, in the, in the petri dish, I mean culture, you gene correct the cells, and to do that, you use what we call a va viral vector, and this viral vector is actually a HIV derived vector. Obviously, we you know, remove everything that could be still uh, toxic as an HIV vector, but we keep the faculty of this vector to be able to infect the cells and bring the healthy gene to the cells. Then you end up with a mixed population of gene correcting cells and, and uh, non correcting cells. Then, as I mentioned, you have to do some uh, chemotherapy to remove the own bone marrow stem cells that don't have a correction. And then you will reinfuse a one time infusion in the patients. So, as I said, this approach is, is safer, but the, it's very challenging to, to generate, you know, to manufacture these cells. And that's, you know, uh, the challenge of, of, of uh, gene therapy today. So, just to try to uh, uh, have a, a short schema of what's going on in the, in the uh, level of a cell. So, here you have your hematopoietic stem cells that are, is missing the, the gene. So you bring your uh, viral vector here, so your virus, in the same uh, petri dish, you know, with some condition to uh, accelerate the infection of a, of a uh, virus to the cells. Then the, the virus uh, release is uh, uh, the gene, the, the CTNS gene into the cells, which will then integrate the genome of the cells. So that's why when it's corrected, it will be corrected for the rest of the life of a, of a patient because the gene will be part of the genome. And then you will have a, a healthy protein that is expressed. So as I said, you know, to go from bench to bedside was very challenging. Uh, and we had to first uh, contact the FDA and we did that in 2013. Uh, then you agree with the FDA of what they want to see as safety studies to show if you can start a clinical trial. So we did that. You know, we had you know, uh, to do many um, steps to be able to fit the regulation of the FDA. And then you have to do all the toxicology studies, the manufacturing, and the cl clinical development. And this will be part of a big investigational new drug application that you uh, submit to the FDA. So this is our three part of uh, uh, IND. Uh, this is what we've done you know, during these many years. So we did all the uh, toxicology studies in vitro and in the mice model. We did the manufacturing development and this will be, um, actually the, the cells will be gene correct. So manufactured at UCLA, not at UCSD because the clinical trial will be at UCSD, but the, the cells are manufactured at UCLA because we uh, they have everything in place there, and Dr. Cohn uh, will uh, will do that. He's one of the leader in gene ex vivo gene therapy in the world. And we had to develop uh, the clinical design of uh, of this. And we have uh, you know uh, a, a, a cystinosis stem cell gene therapy consortium of 15 members, and I will uh, show you the names after. But you see that it's a big team of people that we had to have for that. And so we assembled everything, and it was, and this doesn't represent the real thing. I mean, it's, it's like 10 times that. But, and uh, we were lucky to be approved last December. So we could, have, we could start. Thank you. <laughs> 
that was a big milestone. And um, and and then the FDA said, okay, it's safe to proceed. You can go ahead and and start the clinical trial. So I will just go through the step of a clinical trial and. I'm lucky, as I said yesterday, to, um, to, I'm happy to say that we have actually started. We had our first patient in, in a two, who is at 2CSD right now. Um, so, um, so yeah, it, it's happening. Um, and actually starting a clinical trial was another challenge. You know, you always have, you know, change, but you know, here we are. And um, so these are all the people, you know, the consortium involved in the clinical trial. So. Um, the principal investigator of, of this trial are, are myself, but the clinical uh, uh, PI, actually Bruce Barshop, who was here yesterday, I'm not sure if he's, oh, here he is. So yeah, so Bruce is here. So, you know, if you want to talk about the clinical aspect of, of this trial, please go to him. He has been, he's amazing. I mean, he's really uh, take a lot of time with uh, the patients and explaining everything. So um, please go to uh, talk to Bruce. And we have uh, Ted Ball, who is a bone marrow transplant doctor, because the bone marrow transplant is one of the um, uh, most risky part of this whole trial. And so we had to have the best to, uh, to um, have uh, in, in, in our uh, team. But then you will have, you know, you have an eye doctor, you have GI doctor, and you will, re you will see that we are lucky enough to have uh, a lot of experts in cystinosis in this team. Uh, you have, uh, so Ranjan Dohil, you will re recognize maybe Robert Mack, uh, Doris Troner that you saw yesterday, um, and uh, you have also Paul Grimm and Nancy Stack. So um, all these people worked really hard to try to uh, design and conduct the clinical trial. So the inclusion criteria of this trial is that for we have three cohorts, a total of six patients. So it will be two patients per cohort. The cohort one and two, it will be adults only, so 18 and older. The third cohort, it, it will be uh, uh, 14 and older, adolescents, if the risk assessment is good. So, I mean, you have a lot of uh, inclusion criteria, but bottom line, uh, you have to have a good organ uh, function, and it doesn't matter if you, have a, uh, if you add a prior kidney transplant or not, but you have to be at least one year post kidney transplant to be included. So the first step is uh, you have to, to uh, uh, sign informed consent and go to through screening. So informed consent is like a lot of paper and this is when ever, uh, the Bruce will ex actually explain to you every step, every risk, everything that you will have to go through. And then you have to do, uh, go through the screening to see if you are eligible, if you can be, uh, participate to this clinical trial. Then the second step, you know, if you are eligible, you can st really start the clinical trial. And the first step is the baseline evaluation. So what is baseline evaluation? And all this will, be, will take place at UCSD. So baseline evaluation is that we want, to, because it's not only a safety clinical trial, it's also efficacy. So we want to test every single tissue function to see if we can improve the clinical outcome. So obviously we are uh, testing the, uh, the kidney and you will see also the name of the doctor responsible for each of these uh, testing uh, in red. Uh, you have the eye and actually now we also have Dr. Afshari for the eye who is a, a corneal doctor specialist. Um, and we do, uh, we do very cutting edge uh, uh, procedure uh, for many and some uh, for many of these, we don't just don't do a standard of care. Uh, we do really more advanced uh, uh, procedure for that. And for instance, for the, for the eye uh, exam, we also do in vivo confocal microscope so to see and quantify all the crystals in the eye. So we are testing the muscle function. Uh, we are testing, you know, you, uh, so Dr. Do uh, uh, Doris Troner is uh, doing all the neurological evaluation. Uh, you have a respiratory and heart function. Uh, the thyroid function will also be um, uh, evaluated. And then we also needed to see if the cells engraft into the tissue, if, we, if they are here, if they do the same thing that what we've seen in, in, uh, in the mice. And it's, um, the, so we needed some tissue from the patient, but uh, you know, a patient is not a mice. So it, it, you had to, we had to find a tissue that is easy access and that doesn't leave scar and that, according to Dr. Doyle, is not too invasive, so we had to do the rectal biopsy. 
so that's what will have been to be done to see or so, so we can do uh, visualize the crystals, measure the cysteine, and see if at the after transplant, if we have cells that are present, if stem cells that are present in the tissue. We are also developing the in vivo confocal microscope. Uh, so it's like a non-invasive way to be able to visualize the crystals into the skin. And we have a big natural story going on actually in our lab to try to correlate the crystals with a, uh, a clinical outcome. And so we have already imaged 66 patients so far. So the, the, the first, third step is now the harvesting of the stem cells. So this is what we call a, a leucophoresis or aphoresis process. So you take some drugs to mobilize the stem cell into the blood, and then during uh, two to four days, we collect your stem cells. Then the stem cells are gene corrected, and this is where the step we are now. So the leucophoresis is, be, is, is going on now, and we, next week we will actually manufacture the stem cells. The cells. So during that time, so this will take about... Um, three months, two to three months, and during that time, the patient will go home. Um, and at this time, the patient will also stop the eye drop because we, uh, the eye will be one of the major endpoint to measure efficacy of a, of a study. So we want to have a patient out of eye drop to really evaluate the quantity of crystals with no eye drop. And so we will have to stop and, and, and we will, of course, this will be very closely monitored after, after we have the transplant. So when the cells are, 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 are manufactured and will be characterized, so if everything goes fine, about two, three months, we have a product. Then the patient can come back, and this is when the, what we call myeloablation, so they, they have a chemotherapy to remove their own stem cells. And at this time, this is when the patient has some risk because he will be completely immune depressed. So he will have, the patient has to stay in the hospital during a month. I mean, I mean, sorry, first you have infusion of a stem cell, obviously, so you, you infuse and it will take you know, a few hours to reinfuse the stem cells. But you will be, um, but you know, this is when you, the patient will be a month, a full month in the hospital, closely monitored, to make sure that there is no infection going on during that period. So once the, everything goes fine, the stem cells come back and your immune system are back, then the patient can leave the hospital, but will have to stay in, in San Diego another two months because he will have to come back regularly, make sure everything is okay, that you know, the immune system is back and everything is normal. So, and, and during that period, as I said, you will stay either in a hospital, um, sorry, not uh, in a hotel, or you have some, uh, some apartment at, at, uh, next, to the, um, uh, next to UCSD. And then, every six months, we will do a full evaluation. So all the, the, the everything that we evaluated during the baseline, we will do it again to be able to see if we have cells that are graft into the tissue, so if they, can, if they really do their, what they are supposed to do, if we uh, decrease the cysteine content in the tissue, and if it's the clinical outcome are, um, are better. So, um, yeah, so, and during all this period, the patient will be out of cysteamine, but if the patient will be lower by of 1.9 nanomolar per milligram, we will not resume cysteamine. If they go higher, we will resume cysteamine. So, and Bruce will evaluate you know, what to dose of cysteamine we can give. And so this was my last slide. I will be happy to answer any question. And first, I also want to say uh, thank you to every member of my lab who have worked really hard on this project. All our collaborators, the, 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 all the members of the consortium, Avrobio, and all the funding uh, um, uh, we received for this project. And I'm so happy to say that we just received a $12 million grant from CIRM to be able to conduct this clinical trial. So we have the money to do that. Thank you. bit over time, so I think yes. we'll save the questions till sure. the end, if that's okay. So uh, our next speaker, uh, who flew all the way in from uh, Montreal, missed his plane yesterday, but he's here, thank heavens, is P Dr. Paul Goodyear. 
So Dr. Paul Goodyear is at uh, Montreal Children's and McGill. He is a pediatric nephrologist and geneticist. He trained at Harvard uh, and in Boston, and he uh, uh, went to McGill and Montreal for pediatrics and nephrology and genetics, and he's been there ever since. And he's going to be talking about a no-nonsense approach to cystinosis. Thanks, Paul. So I guess I'll have to operate also from this side of the room to see the slides. I apologize. But um, what I would like to do, uh, I better use this. Thank you. What I'd like to do is to tell you our progress on a project that I refer to as a no-nonsense approach to, to cystinosis. <clears throat> so as you know, the um, current therapy of cystinosis involves cystamine. Cystamine can penetrate the lysosome can chemically remove the cysteine that's in there. And <clears throat> thank goodness we have this, because uh, Bill Gall showed years ago that this works in humans. So th <clears throat> this is a confirmatory study from the experience in France. Uh, it uh, was published about eight years ago by Brodin Sartorius. And uh, let's take a quick look at what they, they confirmed or, or saw in their patients. Uh, on the left, is the percent or the fraction of people who still have a functioning thyroid. Of course, zero would be no. And those curves <coughs> show the, the rate at which various people in the group uh, finally became thyroid insufficient. So do I have a pointer on this? No, <coughs> I do. There's a little guy right there. OK. Ah, yes. So um, <coughs> here, this line shows you what happens to untreated patients uh, by 10 years or so. Uh, the very few have a functioning thyroid, so they all need replacement. But with cystamine, the curve has shifted to the right, 10 or 15 years. The same thing is seen with the, uh, the onset of diabetes. Again, the, uh, the curve has shifted to the right. Same thing with neuromuscular disease. And the same thing with the onset of renal failure sufficient so that one needs a kidney transplant or dialysis. So that's fantastic. It's really important. However, <clears throat> there's some caveats. If you look at these data very carefully by the same group from France, um, what we have is on the left, the the age at which dialysis was started. And on the bottom is when did the child start taking cystamine? And as you can see, <coughs> for people who are untreated, the average age of dialysis is about 10. For people who start after the age of about five, uh, it's as though, for the kidney point of view anyway, it's as though you didn't take very much. Maybe there's a little bit of improvement. There are a few people who are going as much as 15 years, but not, there's not appreciable uh, improvement. Now let's look at the colored boxes here. <coughs> In the blue are kids who clearly have benefited. All these people have exceeded the usual 15-year max. They were all transplanted after that time. And <coughs> the, the, these are still going without transplant. So wonderful effect for those people. The sobering part of this is in the pink uh, box, and those are people who started early, in this case, less than three years, but all of them are <coughs> going to dialysis early in this quadrant. You can't really tell them the difference between those people and the people who have no treatment at all. <coughs> so what does this mean? What is the explanation? Why is this uh, imperfect? And so one possibility is simply that uh, something you all know, and that is it's tough to take cystamine for a long time. <coughs> These are just my, this is a cartoon of my experience in Canada looking at white blood cell cysteine levels. It's fine in the beginning. It gets a little dicey around 10 years. 
And after 10 years, forget it. There's <coughs> very poor adherence, understandably. <coughs> and Dr. Araceta in Spain reflected this same phenomenon by just asking directly the, her patients. And they, if you're less than 11 years old, uh, it looks pretty rosy. <coughs> and they say, yep, I'm doing it every day and I rarely miss and so forth. If you're more than 11 years old, not so much. <coughs> they, um, they clearly report uh, declining adherence. <coughs> so that's one explanation. And we hope that the delayed forms of cystamine, the pro-drugs that are being developed, and these other <coughs> possibilities may improve that. However, there's probably another explanation, and that is uh, really based on observations in research labs, fundamental labs around uh, Europe and North America. And from these labs, it's clear that some of the cysteamine doesn't even sit in the lysosome. It sits out in another part of the cell, that yellow box. It's doing something there, but we really don't yet know what it is. Furthermore, some of the, cyst uh, the cysteine, I meant to say cysteine, the CTNS protein, some of the CTNF protein is sitting in the lysosome, but it interacts with the other proteins in the lysosome and probably is involved in this uh, housekeeping operation called autophagy. <coughs> so I like to think of autophagy as one of these guys, these little robots that you can buy that wander randomly around the, the, the kitchen floor while you're away, uh, sweeping up some of the garbage. And the same, really, something very similar happens in cells. There are membranes that trap debris and deliver it to the lysosome. And the, the vesicle that traps the debris has to fuse with the lysosome. And then all the, the junk is delivered and chopped up. So this sh slide shows you some of those little yellow dots, which are the, the autophagosomes doing their work in a normal cell, proximal tubule cell. And this is just a higher magnification. You can see these little dots. That, and below is, a, uh, is the same cell where we've knocked out the CTNS gene. And something very weird happens. You start seeing these large ring-like structures uh, that appear to be, and we've got other data for this, they're, they're, it's a failure of fusion with the lysosome because in the cystinotic cell, there, the CTNS protein is missing. It seems to be crucial for this function. So the challenge is, how can we devise therapies that will overcome both the ch uh, function of a CTNS protein as a channel that lets cysteine out and to do some of these other jobs that the cell appears to need? Well, one approach we heard about from Stephanie, this is going to fix everything, both types of functions, because the engineered cells will have wild-type normal protein to deliver to their neighbors. But <coughs> what, I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about is the second, uh, yeah, the second strategy, <coughs> which is useful only for a subset of the patients those with a particular type of mutation called a nonsense mutation. Now, <coughs> Stephanie's strategy will work even for a huge deletion like this, which is common in Europe. But it occurred to me that we might <coughs> be, that it might be worthwhile pursuing a way to treat nonsense mutations because, I at least in Montreal, we found that we had half of our patients actually had a nonsense mutation. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. But a bit of, a bit of different genetics in uh, Montreal and, as you'll see, in North America than what is in uh, Europe. So th the reason for having more cystinosis in Montreal than in many other places is because of, sp because of a specific mutation called W138X, which came over from, it probably arose in Ireland years ago and was transferred to North America by an immigrant 
in the 1800s. <coughs> so just a moment now for some of you can, you're welcome to shut your eyes off. Just try to walk through this biochemical idea. But this is at the base of the, <coughs> the therapy that I'm going to describe. So the way our genetic code is translated into a protein, into building a protein, is cartooned here. So a copy of the genetic code is laid across a workbench, the orange thing here, in the cell. And <coughs> these green spaghetti-like things, at one of, their, of the ends of this long spaghetti strand, is a code that matches or complements our genetic code. So that for every three letters in the code, one of these guys comes in, binds here, and at the other end, these, these different spaghetti strands <laughs> carry individual amino acids. And so by matching their tail to the code, the head can deliver a specific amino acid to the chain. What happens <coughs> in a nonsense mutation is outlined here. So here's another trans, uh, transfer RNA, the spaghetti coming in to match this next sequence, but oops, that sequence, that triple letter there was supposed to be GGA. Just one tiny error switched the first letter to T instead of G. And that produces a stop codon. A stop codon is something that has no match. There is no spaghetti-like structure that can match it. And so the whole process comes to a halt. The protein falls apart, the RNA falls apart, and the whole process stops. And that's why Nonsense mutations are just as bad as a deletion of, of CTNS. Fortunately, I ran into this <coughs> a set of observations, really, that goes back t at least 10, 15 years. And that is that there's a class of antibiotic called an aminoglycoside, which has a remarkable property. These aminoglycosides can bind to the workbench and create enough wobble or, or probably a change in the surface of that workbench such that when the system comes to a stop codon, the system looks at, a, at the mismatch and says, well, there are two out of three matches. We've got to keep this assembly line going, stick in the usual amino acid that would have been suspected, and let's keep going. And that's called translational read-through. <coughs> so, over 10 years ago, a clever biochemist in, in Israel started making derivatives of these aminoglycosides to get rid of the toxicity. We, we all take aminoglycosides, or many of us do, every day. We administer them, but only for a week or so. If we tried to give those same <coughs> aminoglycosides to kids for a year, we would run into toxicity, both in the kidney and in the ear. So uh, the, the biochemist in Israel did a pretty good job of wiping out any kind of toxicity for the mammalian cell while retaining this uh, re useful property. So who could profit from this? And this is a study that you helped us with, many of you. So we found that the, the, the W138X nonsense mutation is, of course, over in Ireland where it arose. And so there are families who are presumably descendants of the original emigrant who came to North America. But it's not just in Montreal <laughs> that this mutation arrived. We've got a lot of it, but it's scattered all the way across the U.S. And that, that was the result of this study, that, that it's widely distributed in the U.S. And this is just a sample uh, on, on this uh, slide uh, because we just sampled about quarter of the cystinosis patients um, in North America. <coughs> That's just a summary. So could this strategy that I outlined with aminoglycosides work in cystinosis for those who have a nonsense mutation? This is a bit of an aside, but I think it's cool, so I'm going to show it to you. It's a, uh, it's a mouse. On the left is a C57 black mouse. And this is the sort of mouse that Stephanie used to create her first model of cystinosis. Cute little guy. He's got nice black hair. 
uh, on the right is his co distant cousin, also the same strain, but this animal has lost the ability to make pigment for the hair. And the reason is that one of the enzymes in the pathway that makes the black pigment has a nonsense mutation in it. So the, the system doesn't work. <coughs> so we took one of the earlier uh, compounds from the, from the Elox company and we shaved our mice, a little patch of hair, and then we gave the drug for a month, and then we plucked some hair out and saw some remarkable effects. So here is a hair with the pigment in the center of the shaft in Stephanie's C57 Black. And this is a hair in a thicker part of the hair uh, from an untreated albino mouse with a nonsense mutation. And that's the hair from, a, uh, from an albino mice, mouse that was treated for a month with this drug. So I was pretty impressed with this. I thought this uh, is, um, is cool. So um, actually before we did that experiment, we started tr testing uh, one of the um, lead compounds called ELXO2 uh, in cells from our patients. We began with, again, a, just another generic aminoglycoside called geneticin. And what we did was just build a synthetic molecule with a red tag on it so that if there was read-through, we'd see red. We injected that molecule into a human kidney cell, and as you can see, when there's uh, no drug, there's no protein, there's no red stuff. But in the presence of aminoglycoside, boom, there's the color. <coughs> and so then we went on to test our lead compound in fibroblast skin cells from our patients with nonsense mutations. And as you can see, in the present, if you give enough um, ELOXO2, <coughs> the cysteine levels fall down to the range that you can achieve with cysteamine. We used, this is a low dose of um, ELOXO2 and injected into to, uh, a mouse with a, a, another nonsense mutation. And you can see that the kidney level of cysteine falls. To give you some perspective, we injected this animal with the equivalent of 0.8 milligrams per kilo of this drug. This would be the equivalent dose that would be used in a human. And for, for comparison, we normally give about 7.5 milligrams per kilo of gentamicin, let's say. So it's a fairly low dose. <coughs> and one last thing. Uh, not only does this drug appear to lower cysteine in nonsense mutant cystinotic cells, but it appears to correct the autophagy defect, which cannot be achieved, as far as we know, by cysteamine. So in the upper left-hand panel is, uh, it's again, I've highlighted those little dots, which are the autophagosomes doing their work, cleaning up the house. And this is uh, <coughs> from a cell, a proximal tubule cell from the urine of my wife's nephew. <coughs> Normal. Down below is uh, uh, the same thing, but a patient's cells, one of my patients who has a heterozygous, just one copy of a nonsense mutation. And again, you see these weird ring-like structures that are failed fusion. But in the pre after only 24 hours of exposure to ELOX2, here's, this is probably abnormal, but most of those structures have disappeared. So this and, and some other evidence uh, indicate that ELOX2, by restoring production of the normal protein, not only fixes the channel defect, causing accumulation of cysteine in crystals, but it seems to be able to, uh, to correct, as one would predict, um, the other jobs of cystinosin protein, which are apparently also important for uh, health of the cell. 
So on the strength of this and other, <coughs> um, other data, we were recently approved by Health Canada to do a clinical trial. And so we, uh, this has been now approved by the, um, our internal IRB and we're kind of ready to go. So next week, uh, I'll probably post the, the uh, clinical trial uh, announcement on the uh, CRF website. I'll send similar things to the organizations, to CRN and, and others. And I will, um, I will be announcing this clinical trial. I'll be very quick because Paul tells me I should be very quick. And I w so the idea is this. We're just to get started. We're only going to try to figure out whether this works in human and figure out a, a, the right dose. A very s limited uh, goal. And we're only going to look for the, our major endpoint of s leukocyte cysteine. We want to see that it gets back into the normal range. So we will just try three doses. We figure from all our work that it's somewhere in this continuum. Uh, we will invite people to join this if they know they have CTNS non-sense mutations or think so. Uh, we will only ask people with stable kidney function to join. We will, this is an important part because I don't see any way around it. We're going to have to discontinue cysteamine for up to six weeks. So um, anybody who joins this will uh, have to go in with eyes wide open. I think that many of my patients have discontinued cysteamine on their own for much longer periods of time, but um, still, it's, a, it's a, an issue. And the last thing is that you'd have to come to Montreal instead of the beautiful weather in Los Angeles and um, uh, spend about five weeks there. Uh, Similar to Stephanie, we were, uh, Health Canada insisted that we start with people 18 years of age, and they said, start with three kids, show us that it's safe, and then you can go down to a lower group, lower age group, so that's what we're planning to do. Um, because we're looking at leukocyte cysteine as the primary endpoint, we'll learn a lot of stuff, but we'll know whether this works, I think, in a short period of time, about a half year. Okay, I'm gonna quit. Um, and I think Paul wants to hold questions because we're behind time. Thank you very much. So I think this is really exciting for the people that do have a nonsense mutation. And if any of you had sent the spit sample to McGill, that was they were sort of keeping track of who had a nonsense mutation. So if you have participated, you might know already. And then. Uh, the way research works is you do the preliminary study to get the dose right, and then you open it up to larger patients. So if it looks promising, you'll be coming back next year to talk about a bigger clinical trial. So we hope you'll be back to do that. Our next speaker is Dr. Larry Greenbaum. Uh, Dr. Greenbaum uh, went to uh, Princeton and Yale and uh, graduated magna cum laude from Princeton, and then he has a PhD in immunology. He and I trained together at UCLA not very long ago, when we still had hair and stuff like that. And now he's currently the chief of pediatric nephrology at Emory. And uh, many of you have been interacting with him in the last couple of days because he's uh, going to tell us about his muscle strength study. Larry. Thanks so much, Paul. Th thank you very much. It's uh, always uh, one of the highlights of my year to come to this meeting. I always feel so welcome by all of you, and it's always great to see old friends and see new friends. Um, and this study that I'm going to be telling you about is a lot simpler than the last two studies you heard about, which I'm, I'm just amazed by the tremendous progress that Stephanie and Paul have told you about. Um, but this is a, a relatively simple study, but was made possible um, by all of the people here in this room, because a lot of this work uh, was done uh, or most of this work was done at the CRN conference in Utah two years ago. Um, additionally, uh, some, some of the uh, work was done at Emory with our own patients. Um, the uh, th three people who uh, are responsible, Julian Hogan is a uh, pediatric nephrologist from uh, Paris uh, who's spending three years with us doing uh, research. Um, and he uh, just told me actually uh, few days ago that he'll be going to Algeria uh, to educate physicians in Algeria in French about 
cystinosis. So he, uh, he is also committed to this disease. And then Helena, who many of you have seen, um, who's our research coordinator. Are, Helena, are you around? There, there's Helena over there. Um, she's a uh, research coordinator at Emory, a graduate of Emory University, and uh, in a year will be uh, going to dental school. Uh, but she has been uh, working on this for the last two years. She was in Utah, in Salt Lake, um, and has done all the data collection, all of the uh, uh, entering of the data and compiling of the data for this study. Um, I want to start by thanking all of you. Again, um, this was really made possible by the willingness of all the families and patients to participate. Um, as I said, much of this data was uh, derived from Utah, so thanks to the CRN, uh, thanks to the patients and families, and thanks so much to Christy, who really facilitated us being able to set up and do this and enroll patients in the study and has really been wonderful in making this a move forward. So just to give you some background, uh, we all know that muscle weakness is a very well described uh, manifestation of cystinosis and in the adult patients that I follow, it's really a tremendous source of morbidity and disability and so it's really I think of great interest uh, to the cystinosis community. Grip strength, which is what we measured as an outcome, is correlated with total muscle strength in both children and adults. So if you just measure someone's grip strength, it gives you a sense of their overall total muscle strength. And it's a validated tool to evaluate isometric muscle strength. In adults, in fact, it's been shown um, to correlate with a lot of heart outcomes in terms of survival in a variety of different patient populations, dialysis patients, transplant patients, et cetera. We've been looking at grip strength in a variety of different populations at Emory. I did a study a few years ago with a medical student where we looked at grip strength in pediatric kidney transplant patients and we showed that it was uh, decreased um, and it correlated with the longer you had had chronic kidney disease, the more your grip strength tended to be decreased. We've done an analysis of the C-KID cohort. This is a longitudinal NIH study that's been going on for about 15 years collecting data on children with chronic kidney disease of all etiologies, um, just following them along. And over the last few years, we've been collecting grip strength data, and we've analyzed that data. And uh, what we've shown is that these children, in fact, have decreased grip strength. So just having chronic kidney disease decreases your grip strength. Uh, the duration of CKD is associated with decreased grip strength. So the longer you have chronic kidney disease, the more of a deficit in grip strength you have. And higher grip strength is associated with frequency and intensity of physical activity. So the more active you are, the stronger your grip strength is. Now this could be that by being very active, you have a better grip strength, or it could be that if your grip strength isn't so good, you tend to be less active. So we don't know whether it's chicken or the egg. And then higher grip strength is associated with improved quality of life. So just having a better grip strength means in general those people have a higher quality of life. So I think this reinforces the importance of grip strength as a general outcome measure. What we did in uh, Utah and what we've continued to do at our own patients is look at grip strength in uh, patients with cystinosis. And this is our patient population. The data I'm going to present today includes 52 patients, really an amazing number of patients. And Helena tells me that we have added um, 21 additional patients at the meeting today, so thanks to all of you for doing that. We really appreciate that. So the final analysis of this data will include well over 70 patients. Um, and you can see it, um, uh, the characteristics, various levels of kidney function. Um, the, about 55 percent of the patients are male, and uh, it shows the age of diagnosis, age cystamine is treated, and the age of participation, a mixture of, of children and adults participated in this study. I just wanted to explain Z-score to you briefly because I'm going to be talking about Z-score. Uh, this is a measure of um, looking at an outcome in a patient population where it's going to vary depending on the characteristics of the patient population. And it's classically done when looking at growth, when looking at height, because obviously a three-year-old 
uh, should be shorter than a 13-year-old. And so if you're going to compare a large group of patients um, and compare and include 3-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 22-year-olds, you need to adjust for what you'd expect their height to be. So you often hear a lot of studies of growth looking at, at Z, at Z scores, SDS, um, your, your think of your percentile that you hear about, 5th percentile, 30th percentile, et cetera. The same thing is true with grip strength. A 10-year-old is not going to have the same grip strength as an 18-year-old. And similarly, uh, an 18-year-old and a 40-year-old are not going to have the same grip strength. The 18-year-old will generally be stronger than the 40-year-old. And also depends on your gender. Uh, males are generally stronger than females. And it also, it turns out, it depends on your height. Um, your grip strength will tend to be uh, stronger if you're taller. So we need to adjust for all of these things when looking at grip strength to really be able to pool all of our data and do our analysis. And so this, this um, illustrates this. Um, so this is a typical distribution. So 50% of the people are above this zero Z score. And the, these are people that are getting, if you're looking at height, getting taller and taller and taller. And very few people are seven feet, six inches tall. Um, in contrast, um, this is going the other direction. Unfortunately for height, this is where I am. Um, and, uh, you know, so you're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And the same thing is true for grip strength. So, you know, um, unfortunately here I'm back down there on grip strength as well. Um, but, um, you know, your grip strength is going to vary. The majority of people are s clustered around this zero Z score. And there are a few people who are extremely strong, and then there are a few people who are extremely weak. So just to give you some background of how we're presenting the data. And this is grip strength in patients with cystinosis. I'm going to first show you the data from the C-KID study. So these are just children with chronic kidney disease. It's, it's just kids, although um, it actually includes a few um, 18, 19-year-olds as well, but in generally mostly pediatric patients. And you can see that the grip strength is lower than it should be. Normally, if you study a population, the average should be zero, but here you're minus 0.61. So that's a, a, a very uh, significant deficit in grip strength. So the, the, this whole curve would be just shifted to the left. So what did we find in our patients with cystinosis? Well, we found an even bigger deficit. So it's minus 2.1. So really a very significant deficit in grip strength, um, as, as one might expect, but it was good to see where we're at. So why is this? What are the risk factors for this decrease in grip strength? Well, we looked at a variety of variables in the data that we collected. Um, it turns out that there were two that were significant. One was age at cystamine treatment initiation. So the younger you are when you started cystamine, the stronger your grip strength would be, just like a lot of the other manifestations as, as you heard about again and again in this conference. The earlier you start treatment, the better your outcomes tend to be. And then the other thing that was very significant, interestingly, was male gender. So in general, males had a bigger deficit in grip strength than females. And again, this is adjusted for the fact that we expect males to be stronger than females, so it doesn't necessarily mean that if you took a 12-year-old male and a 12-year-old girl, that the girl would be stronger than the male, but it means compared to their peers, compared to other 12-year-old boys of the same height, they have a bigger deficit than the 12-year-old girls do. So some more details. This is a, we, we all expected in the C Kid study that grip strength would be related to GFR, the lower your GFR would be the lower your grip strength would be, the more severe your kidney disease, the more severe your deficit in grip strength would be. It turns out in the C Kid study, we didn't find that. There was really not very good association with uh, GFR. It was more the duration of kidney disease rather than your GFR at the time that you had your measurement. And we found the exact same thing in the patients with cystinosis, that the 
relative levels of GFR didn't correlate with grip strength. At a very good GFR, they seemed to have a little bit higher grip strength, but it wasn't statistically significant. And we, we really saw the same thing in the CKID study as well. In males, though, we did see this huge difference compared to females. So the males had a much lower Z-score, much bigger deficit in grip strength. This was highly statistically significant compared to females. And we did go back and look at the C-KID data. In C-KID, there's really just a handful of patients with cystinosis, but we decided to look at those patients with cystinosis and compare it to all of the other diagnoses. And these are the patients with cystinosis. And you can see they, in general, have the lowest grip strength of any of the patients in C-KID. The only other group was a, a group of kids with something called prune belly syndrome, where they have an absence of muscles in their abdomen, and one could postulate that that may affect their ability to do the grip strength test as well. Um, but it's really consistent with the findings that we had from this overall study that we've done with a large cohort of cystinosis patients. So our conclusions, grip strength is very low in patients with cystinosis. Uh, suggests that grip strength is a good way of evaluating interventions to improve muscle strength. So I think, uh, well, I think we need to do a little bit more work, but uh, it really suggests that you know, just measuring grip strength may be a good way of seeing are we benefiting patients um, who um, have cystinosis by any interventions that we're doing to improve their muscle strength. Risk factors, delay in initiation of cystamine therapy, um, we also have some data on self-reported compliance that the patients gave us when they entered the study. Now, it's self-reported compliance with cystamine therapy. We haven't done the analysis of that data yet. We will do the analysis of that when we um, do the full analysis of the 70-plus uh, patients included. One thing that was really interesting to me, it wasn't patient age. The deficit in grip strength was present throughout the continuum of age. So we saw just as much of a deficit in the teenagers as we did in the 30-year-olds. Um, why that is, you would think that you know, it would be more progressive. Um, I think that warrants additional study. I think that's um, potentially a source of some optimism that maybe with um, you know, ongoing therapy that maintaining grip strength will be possible. The deficit in males, it's Difficult to know why that's present. Why are the males having much more of a deficit in grip strength than the females? And I must say that's my general clinical observation of the adult patients that I follow. Um, the males um, have a lot more trouble with uh, uh, muscle strength in terms of activities with daily living. And we did collect some data on activities of daily living, problems with swallowing, um, problems with um, um, you know, respiratory, muscle weakness, et cetera, that we're going to also add to our analysis. Um, could it be adherence? Could it be that males are less adherent with their cystamine therapy than females? Or could it be some other factor? And we hope to explore that as well. And then uh, next steps, uh, we're going to complete and publish the cross-sectional study. We think that will be submitted relatively soon. Uh, we just really need to plug in the data from the additional 20 plus patients that we've gathered here, but it's all programmed into the uh, uh, software, so it should be easy to do. We'll reanalyze re re that data. And then we're going to add the following data activity level, self reported adherence to cystamine, symptoms of decreased muscle strength, and transplant status and dialysis history. We are continuing to gather longitudinal data. We're going to publish the cross sectional data, so just one data point in each patient. But we've been collecting ongoing longitudinal data every one to two years, re-measuring grip strength. And we want to see how it changes in patients um, over time. Does it change? What are the risk factors for it changing? And so we hope that if any of you have participated or you have children that have participated in Salt Lake City, please come back today and get another grip strength done so that we can get um, additional longitudinal data. Um, we hope to further explore the deficit in male patients, and we want to identify interventions to test using grip strength uh, as an outcome. 
And again, I want to thank all of you for participating in this study. You really have made this study possible, and the CRN is going to be um, thankfully acknowledged in uh, the manuscript that will hopefully be published as a result of this research. So this is uh, definitely a CRN uh, publication, and thank you very much for your attention today. I was trying to get us caught up, but I'll ha be happy to answer questions. Paul? That's our next study. Um, you know, the, the, the deficit was present it wasn't, it didn't vary by age. I, I can't, I didn't pull out, I haven't pulled out just prepubertal males. That's a great, a great idea to look at specifically. But we didn't see any change throughout the age overall. Um, but we didn't specifically look at prepubertal males. Um, our, one of my hopes is to um, take a look at, um, uh, in working with our endocrinology colleagues, and obviously this would require blood tests and so forth, but we could do it in our own patients um, looking at uh, testosterone and its potential relationship. Other questions? Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. To, to address Dr. Goodyear's question, I have something that might be relevant. Uh, when we did um, at at Stanford, uh, our study last year, which hasn't been published yet, we did DEXA studies, and we found that even at the youngest age of the children, down to age seven, there was a deficit in lean body mass on DEXA studies, even at the youngest age, and they had no symptoms. So this may be something that, that is significant prepubertal as well, and that would go along with what you were finding. The next person to give a presentation is Dr. Katharina Hohenfelder. And she is at the University of Rosenheim, which is close to Munich in Bavaria. And uh, Germany is a very big country. <laughs> We've been teasing her about that all day. She is interesting because she runs a completely holistic cystinosis clinic for a large percentage of the German patients, where the patients, when they come, they see a neurologist, OT, PT, orthopedics, endocrinology, nephrology, a bunch of other ologies and sort of like they go from room to room to room in speed dating and she is, it's a wonderful clinic and I think that there's going to be a lot of interesting research coming from her in the future. And she also uh, has a side interest in telemedicine. So uh, who knows, maybe we'll be able to have visits with her from the USA sometime. Anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here and to present two of our studies of the Cystinosis Foundation in Germany, which we have created in 2015. So before I start, I just want to point out Germany very shortly because I learned yesterday that everything in Germany is in between three hours. This is not true. Um, uh, Rosenheim is a very small city, very close to Lake Chiemsee, and I live close to Salzburg in the mountains. Uh, this is called Berchtesgaden, close to the Königssee. Um, the first project I want to present is the newborn uh, screening for cystinosis and spinal muscular atrophy. As Paul already said we have we started an interdisciplinary clinic in 2012 and we have now 94 patients we are seeing children and adults at the same time and if we look at the kidney function the kidney function the renal survival is very close to the time at diagnosis and time when treatment started so Patients who have been diagnosed and treatment started below 1.57 years 
have a much better renal outcome than patients who have been older at diagnosis and started treatment later. Um, the publication of Robert Kleta and Bill Gahl showed uh, the importance of early treatment in s two siblings. The brother was first diagnosed and his brother was start uh, treatment started in the first four weeks of life. So renal function was preserved much better. If we are talking about newborn screening, newborn screening is a very important public health program and has vastly improved the outcome of several diseases by early diagnosis and treatment. And it's very closely related the story to phenylketonuria. In the 1960s, Robert Guthrie developed a bacterial test, and this test allowed to identify patients with phenylketonuria right after birth, be before they had clinical symptoms, and the patient got a diet, and they have been healthy. So in 1968, in Germany, in West Germany, newborn screening was established for phenylketonuria, and then the next metabolic disease, galactosemia, was added, and then some endocrinopathies. And between the 1970s and 2000, there have been several diseases where you found treatment and they could be identified, so there was a need to increase the number of diseases who could have been detected by newborn screening. And tandem mass spectroscopy allowed to extend the newborn screening to 13 diseases. No, this is not true, 13 diseases in Germany. So in 2005, the newborn screening in Germany was extended to 13 diseases. And in 2017, the first time a genetic screening only as a confirmation um, diagnostic was introduced in Germany for cystic fibrosis. Talking about newborn screening is also talking about Wilson and Junger. They designed uh, the principles for a screening and these principles are still valid. So. It's very important that you, if you screen for a disease, you have to have a treatment. You have to have facilities for diagnosis and treatment for all these patients. And you also have to have a suitable test. These principles have now um, changed according to the new technologies. And it's very interesting because you have different requirements in different countries according to their laws. So if we think about the screening uh, for cystinosis, these principles are still valid. There's an effective te therapy. The patient do not show any clinical sign after birth. The time at diagnosis is crucial and when patients are diagnosed according to their clinical symptoms, they already have substantial renal damage. And the test which is available now, um, the cystine level in white blood cells, this is not a test which you can use for newborn screening because it's, you know, you need too much blood and it takes too much time. So the question was, is there any possibility for a newborn screening for cystinosis? And the first idea we had is why don't we use a urine dipstick at six weeks of life? Because the children in Germany have at six weeks of life, um, they have to see the pediatrician and it's cheap. And you can also identify patients with other metabolic diseases. But there are two problems. First of all, you do not have any screening infrastructure which is um, important and which you have to uh, show to the government. And the second thing is that you also have patients with cystinosis and they do not have glycosuria. So if we talk about routine German newborn screening, which is a voluntary national health program, um, it's covered by the health insurance. It needs a written informed consent of the parents. 
it's used dry blood spot cards. It has to be done after 36 to 72 hours of life. It has to be analyzed in certified screening laboratories and the routine newborn screening has to be processed in 24 hours and you have to give an immediate information if you have a positive result to the hospital. So it's quite complicating and it's very demanding. So it, the idea was why do we not use this screening infrastructure and why don't we use the dry blood spot cards? If we are thinking of a genetic screening, there are more than 100 mutations are described in the cystinocene gene. In Germany, we have a different situation, which we heard already about, because most of the patients are carrying, whoop, most of the patients are carrying the 57.2 KB deletion. And we checked all our patients, and there's already a publication, and what we found is that most of the patients are carrying these three mutations. So, according to these mutations, we designed a two-tier strategy for newborn screening. In the first step, we are doing PCR reactions for the three most common deletions, and with this um, screening, we will detect 75% of the homozygous or heterozygous patients. If we will find a heterozygous patients, the probe will go in a next generation sequencing and we will look for 101 mutations which we, which we checked in the literature. With this two-tiered strategy, we calculated that we will find 98.5% of patients with cystinosis. So the next generation sequencing is the expansive part of the screening, and we calculated um, how many heterozygous probes we are going to detect, and we have been calculating that we have about 500 heterozygous probes in about 100,000 newborns. In Germany, we have different screening labs, and the screening labs are taking care of different parts of Germany, and we picked two laboratories, one in Munich and one in Nordrhein-Westfalen. These are very large screening labs. Um, the Munich lab is screening about 110,000 newborns and Hannover 250,000 and we got the ethic committee approval and we decided that we are not going to involve any official uh, ministries or sites because we didn't want to get in any trouble that we are doing genetic screening and at this point I want to thank CRN and Christy because the first money we got was from CRN and it made it much easier to collect the money for the study. And um, the plan was that with a written informed consent of the parents, we are going to integrate uh, the molecular-based screening in the routine newborn screening uh, for these two labs. So this is how it works in the morning, the routine uh, newborn screening, the metabolic screening is done, and th then in the afternoon the DNA extraction starts with small punches from the dry blood spot cards, and then there is a multiplex PCR reaction for the three mutation. Um, we choose to use SMA spinal muscular atrophy as a housekeeping gene because we have been afraid that if we screen for 300,000 newborns and we do not find a cystinosis patient, perhaps the method is not okay. So we choose another rare disease which is more often than cystinosis and we included it as a housekeeping gene. So this is how it works. These are the PCR, uh, just as an example for the 57 KB deletion. It's um, fluorescent marked and you have different melting points and according 
if you have a deletion, um, you will see it um, with the different melting points. And you can define between homozygous and heterozygous probes. And the heterozygous probes, they all go to the next generation sequencing. So these are the results. We started last year on, in January. Until now, we screened 257,000 newborns. Um, the lab processes about 1,000 probes per day. Uh, the number of heterozygous probes was lower than expected. We found one patient with a homozygous 57 KB deletion, and we found another patient with a compound heterozygous deletion. And this is an interesting patient because he was described in the literature to have cystinosis. His leukocyte cysteine levels have been normal, and according to the ACMG classification, this mutation has um, a frequency of about 3% in the normal population. So um, we think this is not a pathogenic mutation. So until now, we have no false positive patients. We have no false negative patients. We did a survey in the pediatric nephrology departments from the areas where we screened, but it's still very early. And the most important part is that the adherence for the normal newborn screening in Bavaria was the same. So the parents did not feel, um, because they signed for genetic screening, they haven't been afraid. The further perspective of this study is that we try to run the project for another three years and we try to implement the screening in the normal routine screening in Germany. So this is the group who is working on this project. The organization is through the Cystinosis Foundation. This is the lab in Munich, the lab in Hannover. We have um, geneticists. This is Carsten Bergmann, who is very much involved in renal diseases. And for SMA, we have a partner also in Munich. Um, now, I want to change the subject, and I want to just uh, show you very shortly um, the other study we do. This is improvement of motor abilities in patients with cystinosis. And we already heard the very nice talk of you, Larry, about grip strength. We did this as well in our patients. And what was very interesting to us is that patients who are doing a lot of sports, physical activity, they had a much better grip strength. We didn't look at our data so sophisticated as you. So the question was, how can we improve muscle strength and cardiorespiratory performance in patients with cystinosis? And we wanted to have a program for children and adults, and the possibility to implement the training in the daily life, because I think this is very difficult for young patients. They have already all the medication. You know, you have so many um, treatments, and for the adult patient, they have their work in their daily life. So the training has to be short. It has to be a short training time, and it has to be done at home. And what we found, what is very interesting, there's already a very well-established method. This is the Galileo training. This is a whole vibration body treatment. And there are a lot of studies done in children and in adults. And it was proved that you can increase the muscle strength and also the cardiorespiratory function. So the nice thing is, you it's very well established. You can do the training at home. You have an extremely short period of time. It's only four minute training and the maximum is twice a day. And you need six to maximum 10 training units per week. So we designed a study with two patient groups 
This is pre-pubertal and this is adults. It's a matched pair design with 20 patients being in the intervention group and 20 patients being in the control group. It's standardized training at home, and the question is, can we improve muscle strength and cardiorespiratory condition, and will this improve quality of life? The database is medical and physiotherapeutic data before, during, and after the intervention, and these are clinical and laboratory data, including PQCTs, and the me measurements of muscle strength will be the Leonardo plate six minute walking test and the grip strength. We also will measure the daily movement of the patients. There will be a training diary and a questionnaire to the quality of life. Um, so this is the study protocol and we are very anxious because we will know if the study will be approved in the next three weeks and after a run in period the control group will be without any intervention, but they will get the plates after we finish the study. And this is the first training group. The training is quite long for four months, and this is the second training. And the good part is all the investigators are getting also a plate. So thank you very much for your attention. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rick Cascal, and uh, Dr. Cascal is the head of pediatric nephrology at Albert Einstein and Montefiore in uh, New York, and he trained in Cincinnati uh, and at Montefiore, and then spent some time at uh, Stony Brook at Sunny, and then moved back to uh, Einstein, where he's been there for many years, and he's provided many services to the pediatric nephrology community over the years. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the life course journey. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, and Christy, for allowing me to uh, present. And uh, uh, for Dr. Zariski, thank you for the bow tie. But the next time, you got to lose the bow tie and just put the clip, because it was about an hour this morning to figure out how to do this. <laughs> Sorry. So I wanted to address something that I think uh, hasn't been looked at before in our community of investigators and, and, uh, and patients and families. And that's a term that's coming more and more into play called life course. I uh, didn't really know what life course uh, meant until a few years ago when I was asked to serve on an NIH committee looking at life course. And uh, for me, I think this opens up opportunities uh, for us in the community and some of the excellent talks we've heard over the last two days clearly will um, give us a, a chance to think about where we could fit in opportunities for research and advancing uh, our understanding of cystinosis across the entire life course. So this is a, an illustration that many of you have seen uh, just to uh, remind us that uh, things start um, early on in utero and uh, there's a lot of determinants here that result in the, uh, to the fetus, to the newborn across the early ages. I'm over here, I'm having knee surgery Tuesday. I got rid of the cane for this talk, but I'm up here. But most of the people we're talking about right now are over, over here. And to define what life course is, uh, it's, it grew from a, a, a theory, a sociological approach uh, in the 1960s to uh, look at social structure and cultural influences uh, on health, determinants of health and then illness and examines the effects of the life course history of a variety of human outcomes. Uh, it focuses on pathways, uh, mechanisms, and research processes across multiple levels from genetic to socioeconomic, social structure, including the maternal, pre- and postnatal, infancy and childhood periods, adolescent, early adult, and the aging time period. So, we used to call this lifespan. Lifespan meant the study across the entire lifespan, but now it's been replaced with life course. It's more appropriate to think about life course because 
lifespan is increasing, and the lifespan is increasing, and they couldn't really uh, use that because they don't know the final outcome. Uh, it involves developmental and biologic trajectories considered over time. It's certainly interdisciplinary in, na in nature. It started off as a sociologic theory. It now involves uh, researchers across uh, the spectrum at most institutions. And the NIH is uh, encouraging institutions that have awards to include life course research in their opportunities for investigators to collaborate. In fact, moving forward, some of the grants won't be funded unless there's some statements in the grants about life course and special populations uh, and uh, women and children. So the idea is to uh, give us a tool to understand and integrate also health disparities that may occur throughout the life course. And uh, this is really uh, an analysis of the continuum that may affect developmental changes, plasticity, and also the effect of what is now called intergenerational exposures on future generations. And I really didn't understand that until I heard that recently. That means that what happens in utero just didn't occur out of blue. That mom and her genetic component were influenced by her parents and maybe the, the, the father's parents. And then the um, product of that pregnancy as it goes through the life course and also produces children, those children will be affected. And this is called transgenerational. And it's something that uh, is new to analyses of health uh, and, and illness. There are models of, of life course. Uh, the usual models involve a cohort, cohorts, I'm sorry, let me back up here. What did I do to back up? The red one, sorry. Um, they're, they're subjects uh, with early uh, life exposures. Uh, birth weights are taken into account, socioeconomic status. Um, and once these cohorts are identified, uh, data can be entered into a registry uh, of, of sorts for investigating uh, investigations using analyses, laboratory experimentations. And an example here to cystinosis is the Naprotex registry, which just started. We're entering information, and this will be theoretically a life course registry uh, for investigators to look at. There are also critical time points uh, along this continuum uh, for uh, unique exposures uh, that uh, are called allostatic loads. And allostatic loads, um, sorry, next one. All allostatic loads involve an exposure that may be adverse, and there are additive uh, allostatic loads that affect the individual and affect the phenotype and expression of outcomes. We don't know all the allostatic loads as it applies to cystinosis, something to think about. Uh, there are stressors, biologic stressors over time that can affect the genes. This is epigenetics, another area of very intense research that has not been applied to cystinosis as far as I know. And Bill, you can, or Stephanie, or Paul, you can correct me on that, but I think we really have a gap in our knowledge of epigenetic influences. And at these critical time points, uh, one can measure with biomarkers once they're identified these exposures, and that would be important in understanding the pathophysiology and, and, and advancing the field. So we really need to define biomarkers. There is some data on the mitochondria. I couldn't find any on the lysosome, but this is an illustration just showing that in mitochondria, experimentally, allostatic loads, sorry, I keep doing the wrong button, sorry, I'll get it. Allostatic loads will affect uh, certain cellular functions in the mitochondria over time, and these can be uh, good good effects as well as uh, adverse effects that affect outcome of the mitochondria so that in disease states, certain exposures and stressors, uh, medications, other environmental toxins will affect mitochondrial function. Well, you only have to think about in cystinosis uh, where these stressors may be working at the mitochondria or how uh, in, in cystinosis 
intracellular trafficking from the lysosomes that are not working are affecting the machinery of the cell uh, in, in the mitochondria or in the processes that are important in maintaining the cell, such as autophagy that Paul mentioned before. We don't know about this. So there are critical time periods that this is defined as a limited time window uh, for an exposure that can have an adverse or protective effect on the development of a disease outcome. Uh, for instance, the poor growth in utero leads to a variety of disorders with cardiovascular disease, prematurity, non-insulin dependent diabetes, hypertension. We know that prematures, and in fact, chronic kidney disease. Exposures in later life can still influence the disease risk in an additive effect, uh, and uh, maternal exposures to any number of things. Here we have thalidomide, which is the hallmark of uh, maternal exposure leading to birth defects, but now we have lead in the environment and what happens to the offspring. Uh, poor intrauterine development really may limit the muscle cell numbers. We just heard about that from two speakers. Uh, that's important, uh, that the structure and poor postnatal hypertrophy may, may uh, be part of the pathophysiology. So there are developmental periods that we really don't know exactly when they start or end, when allostatic loads of exposures may have a, a very great impact. And this is a nice illustration that was just worked on by a, a group uh, from the government that we're part of, looking at this whole concept of a life co course approach to clinical care, showing the effects uh, on the fetus in the mother uh, and the different stages from preconception to in utero to childhood, adolescence, adulthood, into old age, and many of the factors that can interplay with the environment and the genetic component to result in, in outcome. It's very intense. It involves a, a strong team to try and define what these are. More specifically, if we look at some of these environmental exposures and the mechanisms that can work on genes, this is called the epigenetics. And people test for this today. You can take a buccal smear and determine if there's methylation for certain genes, which would show that they are have been exposed to something that could be considered a stressor. That's a simplified way to talk about it. But teeth um, are another way. There was a TED talk about the use of taking teeth uh, and analyzing exposures through time. These are newer techniques that are being applied with epigenetics. But again, we in the Cystinosis Research Committee should be thinking about some of the ways we might want to look at our population to identify one, a critical period, two, a stressor, whether it's socioeconomic, envir an environmental exposure, a toxin, um, and three, what are the biomarkers that might be useful there? Because I think in approaching this from a personalized medicine and targeted therapy approach, we really need to know more because there's such a variation in the phenotype in, in, in patients with, with cystinosis. And I think that opens up a, a lot of room for discussion. There are a couple of examples that I'll show here briefly of how this is being applied in other conditions where we may learn from this as we move forward. The first condition uh, is seen in, a, uh, in patients who have prematurity uh, and uh, preeclampsia. So in the Bronx, we have the highest number of African-American Caribbean women with uh, eclampsia in the United States. In African Americans, there are some gene alleles that are related to the APOL1 gene alleles. There's two risk alleles. Caucasians do not have them, but African Americans do. Roughly 10 to 20 percent of the North American population carry both risk alleles. And oh, if you carry risk alleles, you have in an adult a higher incidence of kidney failure, uh, diabetes, hypertension. If you carry both risk alleles in the fetus, you have a higher incidence of prematurity. And now we showed, and Larry is part of this study, uh, in the chronic kidney disease cohort, those children had prematurity and worsening kidney disease if they had the alleles. In our group in, in the Bronx with Kim Reedy, one of our young investigators, she looked at these women and the population with, with preeclampsia and with collaboration at the NIH with, Bill, with um, Jeff Kopp, we measured APOL1 in the uh, mother's serum, in the newborn, and in the placenta. And what she found 
which was just reported this year and was reviewed in, as, in, uh, as a highlighted article from the science reviews, that if the fetus has ApoE1 risk alleles, but the mother does not, the fetus causes an abnormality in the placenta of the mother to have a, a phenotype that expresses itself causing preeclampsia. The fetus is born prematurely with the two risk alleles and a host of factors have to be followed over the life course there for that fetus. But also, the mother's not an innocent bystander here who goes home after she delivers. Women who have had preeclampsia have risk throughout the rest of their life. If they make it through pregnancy without kidney failure, or hypertension, or stroke, or seizures, they have a high incidence of neurologic complications and other uh, disorders from preeclampsia. So it's the fetus's genetic composition which affects the expression in the placenta. That's a reverse type of exposure that we never really thought, thought existed before. Another example of maternal fetal transmission involves type 2 diabetes. This is exciting, and this area is getting more and more evidence because of the high with the um, epidemic of type 2 diabetes. It involves a concept of the microbiome and how the baby comes out. In the, uh, if the baby is born by C-section, the maternal microbiome populates and colonizes that baby, which is a the baby has a different microbiome if it came out the regular route, spontaneously delivered. And it turns out that in a very large cohort from Europe, and I think it was Scandinavia, they found following these babies that depending on the way they were delivered, their microbiomes were different, and a significant number of the ones that were taken by C-section developed type 2 diabetes more than had they come out through spontaneous delivery. Amazing concept, but it shows also the importance of the microbiome. And this is being looked at uh, in many other disorders uh, through uh, the life course has not really been studied that much. So microbiome is an area for investigators to think about in terms of cystinosis and exposures. It means what we eat, what we're exposed to, what medications we take, antibiotics affect our microbiome. And here's one on cognitive function. Uh, some of John Fox and Sophie are here, and Anna doing neurocognitive and work with Doris as well. A host of factors affect our cognitive function over time. We do know that in, uh, uh, as we've been studying the cystinosis community, looking for any, any um, signs that we might need to intervene, um, this is another area that uh, can be applied with life course theory uh, to our population. So those are just some examples, and, and, and a final example is from, um, I talked about the diabetes, I'm sorry, uh, sickle cell disease. Sickle cell, this is a single gene defect uh, that uh, is pretty uh, prominent in African Americans, as you know, and they have, uh, their, their organizations have looked at the, their population for years. They have some newer therapy at sickle cell, stem cell, Therapy is now being applied effectively for their population um, at many centers. But what this life course study did uh, in the sickle cell population from childhood to adults was look at different exposures and how over time as the patient ages, they can see a different phenotype expression in the conditions that bring those patients to the emergency room or to complications that need to be addressed. And I think the concept here is that knowing what might be expected, uh, again, across the life course, knowing that different organs are involved, whether it's neurological, pulmonary, bone, uh, different crises that happen in sickle cell crises, those are signals that we might want to think about ahead of time when we look at life course research as it relates to uh, cystinosis. So what are things to do for our community when we look at this new uh, science, well, we want to identify what critical time points and factors, such as epigenetic, environmental, psychosocial, are affected in cystinosis, apply what is known regarding multi-organ involvement during growth and development in cystinosis, and how best to examine them using principles of life course, course research. We want to establish secured shared registries and databases 
uh, using uh, electronic medical records, the database that Naprotex is setting up now, biobanks, very important to have material to look at. You can't study the microbiome without some uh, uh, technique to obtain a stool sample of some kind. Uh, other biological co longitudinal cohorts for, uh, can be used for future development of targeted life course research at critical time points. And also this involves multidisciplinary teams using big data opportunities to develop a predictive and a prognostic modeling of multi-organ involvement which can lead to uh, targeted therapy. This is too hard to read here, it's on the poster that we have outside afterwards lunch, but it is a working model that we're applying uh, through the NIH at sites that have awards from the NIH that involve life course to train investigators in life course research, providing them with tools to organize and communicate and apply it to a specific condition. It's, that's where the, the uh, challenge is right now is how to take this theory into, uh, into practice. And I think uh, I'll leave it at that. This is our uh, Frost Valley YMCA camp uh, in the Catskills uh, where we take children with any kidney disorder and mainstream at camp. Some of you may know about this place. It's very dear to my heart. Uh, we've tried to get cystinosis families up here uh, for years. It's great. The only failure I had was Laura Krumenacher. I don't know if she's in the audience. I'm going to embarrass her. I couldn't get her to come up. But, uh, it's an opportunity where children mainstream with regular campers and do everything that regular campers do, and it's a great re rehabilitative experience. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, for our final presentation, we're going to uh, follow up with another presentation from Albert Einstein Montefiore. Um, so this is... Um, a discussion about sensory processing and executive functioning in individuals with cystinosis. Anna Francesco is currently a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Albert Einstein Montefiore. She trained at the uh, University of Algarve in Portugal and then University of Nibijan in the Netherlands for her PhD. So we're very much looking forward to this final presentation and the research morning. This mic is still on. Okay. Did he just turn it off? Huh. Is there an opening? Can you just turn it off?
Yes. Okay, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so today I'll be talking about cognitive function in um, children and adolescents diagnosed with cystinosis. And I'll be uh, talking about some behavioral and electrophysiological EEG findings uh, from our labs. So because I realize that at this moment your attention uh, must be mainly focused on lunch, uh, I decided to start this presentation by its end, so I'm going to give you uh, immediately the take-home messages. So when comparing um, neurotypical controls um, with individuals diagnosed with cystinosis, and I have to stress that here I'm talking exclusively about children and adolescents and about the processes that we have tested and that I will explain uh, in a second, what we see is that actually the neural responses and behavior are more similar than they are different between these two groups. Additionally, when differences are found, compensatory mechanisms appear to be in place. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this uh, during the presentation. So I mentioned uh, um, the processes that were, we were interested in. And although we um, uh, had some more measurements, today I'll be focusing on two of the measurements we took, and that is auditory processing and executive functioning. So regarding auditory processing, we focused on basic auditory processing. That is bac basically how your brain responds immediately after a sound was presented. So the first milliseconds after you hear something Auditory sensory memory is a very, very short-term uh, memory um, that basically helps you keep track of what you just heard. And we were interested in this basic auditory processing uh, for two reasons. First, because uh, we just wanted to uh, check if basic processing was maintained in cystinosis, since if it was not, uh, uh, that, could, uh, that impairment could cascade into uh, impairments in more complex processes. Um, and the other reason is that these more basic uh, processes are actually ideal candidates for biomarkers for, for example, um, disease uh, status or, um, or um, disease status, or sorry, I'm also hungry, so. Uh, the lack of food is also <laughs> impacting me. So disease status or uh, treatment efficacy. The other thing we were interested in was executive functioning. So executive functioning is this umbrella term uh, that includes uh, these different um, um, cognitive function uh, aspects like attention, working memory, um, response inhibition, uh, task switching. So it's actually a fundamental set of abilities for just day-to-day um, -day, uh, functioning. We were interested in executive function because uh, there's some behavioral evidence by Troner and colleagues, colleagues that um, in individuals with cystinosis, and here you see, so in this, can you see my mouse or no? Moving, yeah? So in this axis, you see percentage of below normal limit. And here you see in the y-axis, you see different tasks that are part of this test that is called DKF's test. And it's basically a battery of executive functioning. And what we see with uh, individuals with cystinosis being in black and controls being in white is that a significantly higher percentage of those with cystinosis were uh, below the normal limits in all tasks of executive functioning that were assessed. So we were wondering what were the neural mechanisms behind these um, uh, difficulties. And because we couldn't test all uh, aspects related to executive functioning, we focused on response inhibition. So basically, how well can one inhibit uh, um, a motor response in this case. Okay, so an update on our sample, and I can assure you that all our participants were this enthusiastic. Uh, we tested until now 24, 25 children and adolescents between the ages of 6 and 16 years old, and 5 adults between the ages of 19 and 38 years old and the same number of age-matched neurotypical controls. And here I'm just going to uh, do a quick break. Uh, as you can see, 
uh, we have way fewer adults than we have uh, children and adolescents. So if you are an adult with cystinosis between the ages of 19 and 35 years old, we really need your help. So if you would like to come to New York and, and participate in our study, please email me or call me or find me today uh, so that I can give you more details. Uh, travel ex we have help for travel expenses and for that we are grateful to uh, the CRN. Okay, back to the science. Uh, so very quick characterization of our sample. We used uh, uh, just an IQ standardized uh, um, measure to characterize our sample. And here what you see is, so these uh, axes you have the IQ score, and then in green you have the verbal score, and in purple the nonverbal score. And each point is actually one uh, participant. So what you can see and that what is uh, um, consensually described in the literature is what we find here, that is there's this discrepancy in cystinosis between the verbal and the nonverbal abilities. So that um, individuals diagnosed with cystinosis are stronger in, stronger in their verbal skills when compared to their nonverbal skills. Um, so in terms of verbal, verbal skills, they were actually on average, so it was a typical score and their nonverbal skills were uh, uh, slightly uh, lower average. We did the same measurements in neurotypical controls, and although both verbal and nonverbal indices were actually significantly lower than the ones found in this particular sample uh, of neurotypical controls, I have to stress that our neurotypical control was not a very, very typical population, uh, very typical sense sample in this uh, case, because usually average is around 100, and here we see uh, that our controls uh, were um, slightly over that 100. So before I go on to uh, each of our experimental tasks and to explain you uh, the task that we use to measure both auditory processing and auditory sensory memory. I just wanted to give you uh, an example um, of how things go in the lab uh, during uh, EEG data collection. And the, I, I think I won't have sound, but at least you'll uh, watch the video, okay. It doesn't go this quick though, okay? <laughs> and there's this uh, um, mute movie music that should come with it, but I'm not going to sing. Okay, and we have snakes, uh, and we also have toys, so. Okay, so um, regarding the task uh, that the participants would do uh, when they would go inside the booth as, as uh, you saw there. So you saw the participant wearing a cap, and um, so in each of uh, the cap holes, there's an electrode that is actually the thing that is measuring the electrical brain activity, and is exported and amplified by this just signal amplifier. Um, the participant is inside the booth, and um, they're listening to tones that I'm going to present. No, I'm not going to present to you because I have no sound, but I'm going to explain them to you in a minute. Um, and they are actually watching a muted movie. So what, what's very nice about this task is that actually the participant doesn't need to be paying attention um, to what's being presented for the response to be there. So your brain is still processing the sounds that you are listening to, even though you are not actively paying attention to them. So there should be sound here, so, but, but this schematic, I think, helps understanding. So a typical task that is used to assess both basic auditory processing and auditory sensory memory is this task called oddball paradigm. Here we use the duration oddball paradigm. 
that means that we have regular tones that are being present that we call presented that we call the standards and they are all the same duration so in this case they were 100 milliseconds duration and you see here so all these p p p that are kind of the same duration and then 20% of the time you have these deviants that are longer so as you can see here um, so a longer uh, duration tone so because it's an odd thing that is happening, your brain reacts to it in a different way when compared to just a regular tone. Other than this, we also tried to assess how, uh, how big the demand was on memory. So we had three conditions uh, from uh, shorter presentation to, uh, from a faster presentation to a, um, slower presentation and this means that these so this white space between the tones it was just um, uh, shorter or longer so the longer the presentation uh, is uh, the more demand is being put uh, on working memory so while the participant is in we are seeing all these wiggles I have an example so we just see okay so this video is, is working right so um, we see all these wiggles that are kind of meaningless at this moment, but what we do is that we just uh, put all the responses to each of the sounds that we are presenting together per participant. We average them and then we put them together per group and then we are able to see differences between the groups. And that's what I'm going to be presenting to you are these averages per group. So here are uh, uh, data from just like a frontal central electrode where uh, response was um, maximal. And so what you see here is on this axis you see amplitude, so how big the response was in microvolts. And on this axis you are seeing time in milliseconds. So zero here is the exact moment when the sound came. So you are able to see how your brain is reacting to that sound immediately after it was presented. So as I told you, we had three conditions uh, from uh, the slower, um, in this case, the faster to the slower presentation. And in blue, we have cystinosis, and in lavender, we have neurotypical controls. And what we, we saw for each of the conditions is that there might seem to be some slight differences between the groups. Actually, statistically, there were no differences. So the individuals diagnosed with cystinosis were performing as uh, the neurotypical controls uh, were. So it seems to be the case that basic auditory processing is maintained in cystinosis. As I told you, we, we used the same task to assess auditory sensory memory. And um, so the same type of plot, so the same logic, amplitude, and time in milliseconds, but now we looked a bit later um, in time. So now we are interested in this difference between the standard, so the more regular tone, and the deviant, um, the tone that was longer in duration. So when your brain notices that something odd happened, there's this increase in the amplitude of the wave. So what we are really interested in is in this difference between the deviant and the standard. So the plots I'm going to show you next are reflecting this subtraction uh, between the two waves. So interestingly, what we saw when we compare, again, the same type of plot, and when we compare cystinosis in blue with neurotypical com controls in lavender, we see, and it might seem that this is different, but again, uh, statistics say it is not. So when we compare the um, faster presentation uh, condition, so the one that is imposing less demands on memory with the slower um, presentation conditions, so the ones that are imposing more demands on working me on memory, what we see is that, is that the children and adolescents with cystinosis, they had this significantly reduced response uh, when compared to neurotypical controls, which might suggest that there's some difficulties uh, on sensory memory um, going on in this population. And I'll uh, discuss that a bit more um, in the end. So then regarding executive functioning and more specifically response inhibition, so we not only use the EEG to assess response inhibition, but we also use the DCAFs. And DCAFs was just that test that I had mentioned uh, in which we had some behavioral evidence of um, 
uh, executive functioning being a risk area in cystinosis. So let's start by the DCAFs, and DCAFs has uh, several tasks. To them, just focusing on one task that measures other things, but also measures uh, response inhibition. So in this task, the participant is asked to draw a line as quickly as they can, uh, switching between numbers and letters. So one to A, A to two, two to B, B to three, etc. So what it means is that as it you can probably feel the most natural uh, line would be drawn from one to two and not from one to A. So you kind of have to inhibit this more natural response uh, that you would uh, be giving. So in this task, we measured both the number of errors that the participants made and also the time that they took to complete the task. And what we see, so here it's uh, kind of a different type of plot, but we have, uh, so in bluish, the control group, and in reddish, the cystinosis group. Each of the circles is one participant, and this thicker line represents the median. So when we look at errors, and these are standardized values, so they don't really, uh, ref they are not the raw number of uh, errors that the participants made. So when we look at the number of errors, it is evident that the controls, uh, the both groups uh, performed very similarly. So um, individuals with cystinosis were inhibiting as their response as well as the control group. However, when we look at the time that they took um, to perform this task, we can see that um, and, and here, although it is time, lower scores uh, reflect uh, worse performance. So we see that the cystinosis group took significantly longer to perform this task. So they still accomplished the same end result as the neurotypical controls, but they needed more time to do so. Okay, so the EG task. So again, the same story, the cap and the uh, response amplifier and all the wiggles, but this task was a different task. So we were presenting pictures, and I'll show you an example. Uh, for each of the pictures, the participant had to press uh, as quickly as possible uh, uh, the um, mouse button. But if the picture was immediately repeated, they had to inhibit that response, so they couldn't press. So it goes kind of like this. So press and press and press and press and press, 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 and then couldn't press here. Okay, so this is the task. It might seem easy, but it's actually quite hard. So um, here's the behavior part of that task. So just the uh, button press. So when we look at correct rejections, and correct rejections are those trials in which they shouldn't have pressed and they didn't. So they did what they should have done. We see that, again, um, both groups um, performed very similarly. And that was also true for the false alarms, that is, the times uh, in which uh, they shouldn't have pressed and they did. So uh, a bit more evidence that um, children and adolescents with cystinosis are actually uh, as good as controls inhibiting um, their motor responses. For the EEG, what we were interested in was in the difference between the hit, so they pressed and they should have pressed, and the correct rejections. They shouldn't have pressed and they didn't. So in terms of EEG, and now we're looking uh, a bit more uh, uh, central parietal electrode, and the same type of plot as before, so amplitude here and time in milliseconds here. And zero, in this case, is the presentation of the picture. So when the picture comes uh, uh, on the screen. So we are interested in this difference, so the difference between the hits and the correct rejection. So the plots that I'm going to show you next, they reflect this subtraction only. So here, interestingly, when we look exclusively at these central, more central electrodes, what we see is that here cystinosis in pink and neurotypical controls in blue. It seems to be that later in the processing, so here zero is again the picture presentation, it seems to be the case that neurotypical controls are showing kind of a bigger response uh, than the cystinosis. However, when we look at a different area of the brain, 
it seems like it reverses. So here what we see is that uh, children and adolescents with cystinosis are uh, presenting uh, enlarged response when compared to uh, the controls. So it's interesting to see that the end result seems to be the same, so they are doing the same number of errors, they are um, um, behaving quite similarly, but it might be the case that um, individuals with cystinosis are recruiting slightly different areas of the brain to perform the same task as the controls. And just a piece more of the story is that when instead of looking at the reaction to the response, but we look at the reaction to the error, so they make an error, how, they re how do they react? We see that they are reacting quite similarly. Okay, so to conclude, we saw that in terms of IQ, um, although uh, IQ scores were um, slightly lower than our not very typical neurotypical uh, control group, uh, verbal scores were definitely a strength um, in the cystinosis uh, population. We measured auditory processing and sensory memory, and we saw that auditory, basic auditory processing was maintained in cystinosis, but our findings suggest that there might be some difficulties in terms of uh, uh, sensory memory. As I was saying at the start, these more basic type of processes can definitely impact uh, more complex processes that come after uh, these more basic ones. In this case, it is possible that these difficulties uh, in sensory mem memory are impacting working memory. And there has been some uh, evidence of uh, um, working memory being a problematic area in cystinosis. So, uh, to address these working memory uh, difficulties, it is important to structure the environment so that the load on working memory can be uh, minimized. And for that, just some tips. So break large goals into smaller ones. Uh, simplify information, so kind of chunk the information. Slow down the pace of delivery of information and engage other senses while learning. So for example, type math times tables in different fonts. I don't know if people still type math type stable, but if they do. Um, then regarding response inhibition, we had three different measures. We looked at neural responses, we looked at the errors, at accuracy, and we looked at time. And we saw that in terms of the neural responses, um, they were similar, but our data suggests that uh, different areas of the brain might be uh, recruited to perform uh, the response inhibition task, which could imply that distinct underlying mechanisms are being used uh, when compared to the controls. We saw that in terms of accuracy, the groups were very similar, so they are still being able to accomplish the same end result as the controls, but they needed more time. So although it feels like there's already a compensatory mechanism in place for uh, uh, res response inhibition tasks, since uh, the cystinosis individuals are actually uh, taking longer but uh, accomplishing the same outcome, it's still good to uh, keep in mind uh, that probably children and adolescents with cystinosis will need more time to complete uh, a task. Uh, it's important to decrease distractors and to give clear instructions before a task is started uh, and, and to probably discuss those instructions. So to end, I'd like to really thank uh, the CRN for all uh, their support. Um, Without uh, CRN, this work wouldn't uh, be possible. I would like to uh, acknowledge the work and thank my supervisor, John Fox and Sophie Mohom, um, who initiated this project, uh, and to thank me for to thank thank me also. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, thank them for uh, allowing me doing this work and uh, working with uh, cystinosis and to acknowledge uh, the help of our collaborator, Rick Kaskell, um, and its help in uh, recruitment efforts, and um, to acknowledge the work of Dawa and Katie that collected uh, some of the data that I presented today. And finally, I really want to uh, say how grateful I am 
uh, to all the families that participated in uh, this study and with whom I learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you for giving our, uh, our update on that. Uh, we're, we're happy to help with that research, and you're making great strides. So thank you very much. We apologize for the technical delay. Um, thank you to Dr. Graham for um, hosting um, the session so well and for his technical assistance towards the end. And um, so just a couple of announcements. We're going to have lunch now. There'll be the poster session uh, that will take place from 2 to 3, as Dr. Grimm mentioned. It'll be take place in the foyer outside of the child care area, the Columbus foyer on the other side of the elevators. Um, many of these researchers will have posters there, so if you have questions uh, about any of this work or anything else, they'll be there and happy to answer. I know we didn't really have time for them during the session. Um, and then that poster session will take place from 2 to 3, and then from starting at 3, we'll have the parent panel, and then at 4, the adults with cystinosis panel, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So thank you, everyone.